Right. Um, so uh, this week we are um, working through chapter 11 of the book Outstanding User Interfaces with Shiny. And this is part of the, the JavaScript section of the book. Um, and this is the second chapter of the, the JavaScript section. And, and, and this is in this, the main player is something called the WebSocket, which is a, a slightly more modern way of um, connecting front end of an app to its, you know, server side back end um, process uh, than what you might be uh, used to if you've if you've done things like uh, built. Django apps or something like that, where everything is is performed by making a a post request or a get request. Um, we'll we'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. Um, but this is the 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 kind of the 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 software artifact that that helps you um, pass data from the browser to the server and back again. So you you maintain a kind of constant connection between the two by by using something called the WebSocket. Um, and we'll we'll talk about that as, as we go along. Um, because fundamentally, if if you've written a load of JavaScript code that will be running in the browser, and you've written a load of server code that will be running, you know, if you've run, lit, written a lot of R code that will be running in the server, um, when your app is running, when your shiny app is running, the user wants to be able to uh, select values or click in different parts of the app and expects the app to respond to the to, to the clicks that they make and the changes that they impose on the app. In order to do that, you know, if if you um, say that you want to say you've got a simple app that um, draws a histogram of some data and the user's given control over which subset of the data or all over the number of bins in the histogram or something like that when they pick their subset of the data or their number of bins you have to send that data to an r process uh, which will um potentially make a new histogram um, image that will then be sent back to the user's browser. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, the, the WebSocket is the thing that passes the data. So we need to know a little bit about how the data is transferred and a little bit about WebSockets to understand this, this whole process. Okay, um, so what are we going to be talking about? We're going to be talking about uh, a couple of packages, HTTP UV, um, which is a uh, package for making like HTTP requests using R. Um, and we are also going to be using the, which one is it now? The WebSocket package. Um, in R. Shiny itself doesn't actually use that package. So WebSocket is a, a package that allows you to um, uh, create a, a, a WebSocket and um, you you kind of connect to that WebSocket from the front end and from the back end and, 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 and that allows you to connect together. Right, anyway, let's get on with it. Um, if I do make any mistakes, I may make some glaring errors in this. It's because I'm not completely fluent with the the, the, the chapter itself. Um, right, so what are we gonna do? Um, so the first thing we have in this chapter is an introductory example and, and kind of a, a figure that that um, is a little bit complicated, but um, I think you should be able to follow it. So, we have yeah i'm assuming you can see my um uh window my my desktop uh thing so we have a server here running 
the R code for your app. And um, in this example, we have a client presumably running your app in their browser. So they've got the user interface for your app um, and, and all the JavaScript and CSS and stuff like that for, for defining that user interface in their browser. And we are needed to send data between one and the other. So the first thing that happens is the client will um, navigate to the URL for, for whatever app that the, they w want to work with. Um, and the um and you know and that's how they end up with the code that runs in their browser so that the server kind of sends that code to them um but whereas um if it were a get request or a post request or something like a a, a, a kind of traditional http request when that initial bit of data is sent from the server to the browser, the connection would then close or the server would like um, hold for, for changes to the uh, in, in the front end. What actually happens with a WebSocket is that there's a kind of permanent connection put in place between the browser and the server and data can kind of transfer through from one to the other. Um, at a high level, at least. Right. So, so the purpose of this, there's, there's an app where you have a slider, um, which allows the user to pick a number. Um, and in on the the server side, um, I I believe that the example they had. Uh, in the server, you, you're generating a, a histogram of some randomly sampled numbers. Um, so when the user clicks on this slider or moves it to a, a different value, uh, a value is sent across the WebSocket um, to the, the, the server. Um, and the server itself has a kind of events manager thing that, that handles any messages coming via that WebSocket. So what will happen when it receives a message that says the, 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 the value on this slider has been changed, this on message method will run, which will um, then uh, propagate some some logic that that, that that changes some code in the in the the, the shiny server side. Um, so what will happen is basically at, at a high level, the user changes the slider to some new number. That number is passed across the WebSocket, and shiny knows that you know when that number changes. There's some internal logic that needs to change. Uh, for this particular app, what will happen is uh, a bunch of new values will be sampled and a, a new histogram made. And though that image will be sent back across the, the WebSocket. So the WebSocket stays in place while all that those changes happen. So you've got two things there. I mean, the WebSocket itself is a pretty complicated object. Um, but you've also got two languages talking to each other. You've got JavaScript in the browser and you've got R in the server. They're fundamentally quite different languages, the, you know, the, um, the way they're designed and things and, and, and various things that you were talking about last week, you know, how uh javascript doesn't have the rich different types of number that r has for example um things like um object oriented programming are completely different in the two languages than um um but despite the languages being quite different the 
both uh, are completely fluent with um, data. So you can transfer data from one language to another, uh, even though the two languages are different. You wouldn't be able to transfer like a, um, a, a dot .rds file or something like that, something R specific from R to JavaScript. It wouldn't know what to do with it, but you can transfer data in JSON format. Now there are a number of other formats used in the, in the web to transfer data from browser to server and, and, and server to server and things like XML and um, um, and, and you know, similar languages. JSON is used um, by Shiny to transfer data between the, the server and the browser and back. Um, so you need a way to take R objects and convert them into JSON so that you can transfer them to the browser. And you need a way to convert JavaScript objects into JSON and send them to the Shiny, uh, to the R process. We worked through a book, JavaScript for R, last year which went into this process in, in quite a lot of detail. So in order to add like a, um, a you know, a plotly plot or something like that, an interactive kind of JavaScript widget to a, a Shiny app, there's a lot of process underlying that. You have to encode the data in R in, in an appropriate way for um, plotly to be able to work with it and whatnot. Um, and there are some things that can trip you up when you're first working with JSON as an R developer, but um, uh, we'll, we'll come to them. So in R, um, you can define a bit of, a bit of text here. Um, so JSON is similar to a list in R. Um, so you have uh, key value pairs, you might have what you know the the values within that might include a an array of values or something like that um and there's a close parallel between how this data is structured and how objects are defined in javascript so in in javascript you might have um uh the, these curly braces are used to define an object and and an object in, in in javascript is similar to like what a um dictionary is in python or what a list is in in r um so you've got these key value pairs defined as a string and we can convert that this is our code we can convert that into a json object that could be sent to javascript um so if we copy that over into R, we end up with that, and it's you know, it doesn't look very nice, but um, these kind of encodings, these aren't for humans to look at. These are for for um, computers to talk to each other with. Right. So what we want to do is convert that plain text into JSON using R. Um, so what we might do is, oh yeah, sorry, there's two situations. You want to either, it, as a, on the, in the R process, there's, there's two situations you have to handle. Um, first, when you've received some JSON from a, a JavaScript processor from some other language, and secondly, when you need to create some JSON. Um, and what we're going to do is use a package called JSON Lite, which allows you to read and export to and from JSON, right? Um, so what we can do is we can take that, um, so it's, this library, I think I've got it installed. And we can take this string here. And 
So what we've done, this is equivalent to us having received some JSON from an external process. And we're going to convert it into an R object. So it starts as a string um, and gets converted into a list. So the name field and the color field and whatnot get converted into entries in that R list. Um, we've got a named vector here, and these are kind of single length, you know, scalar entries within within a list. All right. Um, now we've got that. Can we convert that back to a, a JSON object? Um, and we can. Oh, sorry, I've jumped the gun a little bit. Um, okay, so typically you'd end up with a list. Um, da, 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 da. It is possible to convert um, a. Oh, sorry, I see what it's saying. Right, so the nested array, which is this thing here, gets, when you read that into R using from JSON, that gets converted into this data frame. So if we look at class of res dollar animals, that's a data frame. Now, you might not want that. You might prefer to get a list of lists or something like that. And um, there is a way to ensure that you end up with. So here, the animals entry has, it has a single entry, but um, that has a name, a type, and an age corresponding to this first row of the original phone where it was read in as a data frame. Okay, so um, so that's converting JSON that we've received into an R object, and we need to go the other way now. Um, so if we start off with a list like this, um, we can actually we can actually. Um, convert that into a JSON representation of the same data. So if you look at that, if we use two JSON, so again, from this JSON light package, we see that, you know, the values David and purple and mask all get converted into um, like a, effectively like a JavaScript array, each one gets turned into. There is, now that might not be what you want. R's a little bit different from a lot of languages in that really there's no sense uh there there is no scalar in, in R. There are just vectors of length one. Um if you need so what's happened here is the this string here has been converted into a a, a JSON array which may not feel particularly natural. Maybe it would have been more natural for that to have been like name. Oh, sometimes it never quite works. Name to David. So you, um, you're ending up with a JSON scalar rather than a JSON array. Yeah, you follow what the, the distinction between the two things? Um, and if that is what you want, if you want those single single length vectors to get converted into scalars, uh, you can do what is it now? It's this thing auto unbox, which is probably not the most um, um, clear of terms, but. Um, but that's what it does. So auto inbox, if you set that to true, it will convert your um, your length one entries into um, into length one, you know, into scalars. There are there are other niceties that you can do. I think you can wrap things in with 
I, uh, if I come back to Jason. Right, so that works. But if I do something like that, yeah, there is a way. So you may end up with a setting where some of your things are, some of the things that are in your data structure, you want to convert into JSON. But you don't necessarily want all of them to be converted into scalars. Some of them you might want to get converted to arrays, and you can wrap them with this i um, function, which will tell the to JSON function not to unbox those specific things. Anyway, I'm overcomplicating for no reason. Right. Um, so. So what have we got? Oh, yeah, he also mentions this pretty argument here. And what that will do is it will um, indent the object when it's printed out, which is nice for just the purpose of reading. Um, but the kind of things that get passed around between Shiny, the, the front end and the back end of Shiny are considerably more complicated than that. Um, um, like if you if you're passing a whole image or something like that, then you're you're dealing with much more complicated things. Um, so we might have let's have a see. Is this an interesting example? So we've got a list. Uh, so it's a list with a list inside it. So it's kind of nested to level list. And we can convert that to JSON again. Um, so that's converted to a, um, a, a similar kind of nested JSON structure. Right. We'll zip past that one. The alternative, when you're in... Um, when you're in JavaScript, um, how do you convert JSON objects into JavaScript objects? And part of the, you know, the the fluency of JavaScript for for working with this type of data is that this is basically JavaScript object notation. So it's a almost a direct conversion is possible from JSON data into JavaScript objects. Um, so if I, um, if I, I will open DevTools. I don't know, I will go into the console. So if we, um, well, what's happened here? That's funny. Oh, I think I've caused myself problems by um in the I think I've got my dev tool set up to, to do something far more complicated than I actually need. If I go into mode and um so you can do my object. Oh, we'll copy that. Right. So, so we're in JavaScript right now, um, and we can convert that object using this JSON dot stringify. That should be available. I don't think I need to import JSON. I know. Oh, it's not. Yeah, right. Sorry, it's just a typo in the book. My object. And really, what you end up with after converting it to JSON is almost exactly the same structure 
as gets printed out by JavaScript, the 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 REPL for JavaScript, but it's kind of wrapped in single quotes. Um, so the data that was stored in that JavaScript object is converted into JSON with very little difficulty. Um, there was another thing that we, oh, oh come on, everything slowed down, JSON that passed my JSON. So that's converting a JavaScript object into JSON and to obtain a JavaScript object from JSON, you can use this json.parse. Really, the, the conversion on the JavaScript side is a lot simpler than on the R side because JSON is has arisen from JavaScript uh, and is, is much more kind of, there's a much more neat mapping between JSON and JavaScript objects. Right. So, um, so we've got the data, uh, and we've got a way of sending data from our. Uh, sorry, we've got a way of reading JSON data into JavaScript and into R, and constructing JSON data in R and in JavaScript. What we need now is a way to transfer the data from the R process to the JavaScript process, um, and that is done using WebSockets. Um, okay. um, so, like I was saying at the very start, a WebSocket is a way of making kind of bi-directional communication between the, the server and the browser. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a one-to-one -one mapping between um, client and server. You can have multiple clients all using the same web socket to speak to a server. And, and, and that kind of architecture is quite typical for a um, like a chat room app or something. Um, so what we've got, there is, um, yes, so a web, um, uh, now, which is which? Okay, so you can. I find that the 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 terminology. I still find the terminology quite complicated. So we're going to be talking about a a server as a piece of software, which will be running on a server, the piece of hardware. So um, we're going to generate the. The, the server side part of this WebSocket using a package called HTTPV. And um, we're going to be creating the, the kind of client side of a WebSocket using the WebSocket package. Uh, so these are both R packages, although they're similar. Uh, if, if you're working, if you're more fluent with JavaScript, there's libraries available that can create WebSocket. Um, clients and servers in, in, in JavaScript too. Um, right, so did I actually install this? Uh, sorry, I might not have this available. Um, no, no, because it's used internally by Shiny, isn't it? So if we load that package up, we can start a server on my machine on this particular port and um, what we've got here is a way to um, sorry the WS objects is is the web socket so um, that's the thing that kind of sits between the server and the client so if I just copy that there's um, how many so there's uh, this is an, an R R6 class, uh, sorry, object uh, is, is returned by this. So you end up with, um, da, 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 sorry, the WebSocket object here, WS, is an R6 object. So it has these little methods that you can attach to it on message and on class, on close. Um, so what's going to happen here is if it rece receives a, 
so this is the code that runs on the server, right? When it receives a message from the client, it's going to print out this message and send it, it, this message will be printed out in your R process. This message will be sent from the R process on the server to the client. Okay. Um, when the client is closed, when I close the tab, once this is finished running, this message will be printed out in the R side. Okay. So this is going to start a server. Right. So let's have a see. So that's a, a web server object there. Okay. Um, so that's running at the moment. Okay. Um, we're also going to um, create a um, uh, a web socket thing um, that will allow us to connect to that server. So if I do, oh, I might not have web socket installed. Oh no, I do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Server connection opened, and then message. Oh, right, I see. Right, so am I supposed to have opened up this? Let's take that. Right. Oh, sorry. Um, how would it work? Maybe if I just do. No. Um, 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 um. How do I do this? Oh, it, it, I see what's going on. So it's a right. So we're we're creating both client and server in a, in an R session. Right. So forget me trying to run it in the browser. Right. So WS on message. Client received. Okay. So. Right, and what should happen when I send a message across that, across from WS, which is effectively the client side? We're sending a message, then the server, when it sees that message, uh, responds with this message in the the R um, session, so you get server receive message server, and it will send a message across the web socket to the client. Da, 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 da. Right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, and then we'll have to close the client so that the server doesn't keep running forever. Um, so what actually happened there? Okay, so uh, in that, um, we um, we created a web socket. We created a, a, like the client instance for it um, that connected to uh, uh, a server object that we'd set up via that web socket. Um, when the client connected, this uh, which which method was it? Um, on WS Open, is it that one? WS Open. Yes. When the socket opened, this message was printed out um, here um, by the, 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 the server side. Then we sent 
a message from the client to the server. And when the server received that message, it printed out another message. Da, 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 server received the message, this one. Um, and it sent a message to the client and it on receiving that message, the client printed out da, 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 client received message. So you've got data going both ways. It's weird because both the client and the server are running in an R session in the same R session. So it's not a particularly good kind of parallel to how um how shiny works when you know the server may be running in a data center somewhere and your browser may be anywhere anywhere in the world um but yeah and then so we've sent a message from client to server and from server to client and then after that we've closed down the connection um which is quite neat so um you can actually connect multiple clients to the same server, um, but we're not. I'm, I'm going to zip past that because I don't think it's particularly relevant in um, to, to 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 shiny at least. Um, yeah, there's a lot of kind of formal like architecture involved in setting up that web socket interface from the client to the server um and you can have a look on the um mdn documentation well actually i found that a little bit sparse to be honest but there was a um, blog post that's mentioned in the book that explains kind of how to build a chat app uh using web sockets so you'd have a ser a single server and you'd have multiple clients, all of whom can talk to each other via the um, web socket. So they, you know, one client would be sending a message to the server that then gets sent back to all the other um, clients. Um, yes, so the URL for that's in the um, in the book. Um, Shiny itself doesn't actually use that WebSocket. So we've just used something called WebSocket package. Shiny doesn't actually use that. It um, constructs the client end of a WebSocket um, using JavaScript. Um, uh, so what do we do here? JS. So in this, how does it work again? Sorry, I, I did work through this example, but I can't quite remember exactly how it um, works. So it's actually quite a long example. I don't think we'll have time to go through it, to be honest. Um, but what, what it's illustrating i don't think it is actually a a shiny app itself it, it's kind of like a um an example where you've got a, a server side code and some front end code but you're not actually using the shiny package at any point i don't think um so this is a way of defining a um Finding a way to work with a WebSocket object, um, a way to send messages from um, client to server or server to client. And um, what actually happens in the example is you are um, your your user interacts with the browser to um, and and that gives them a little slider that they can pick. Uh, a number with and then in an R session on which the, the server's running um, the value that they chose dictates uh, the um, you know the number of samples in a histogram uh, so it's like a random normal 
data set that's that's chosen with as many value as many values as the the number n that was picked by the the user um yeah sorry the example is a little bit long and i don't think we can get through it in 10 minutes and i think i'd get confused anyway but the the, the essence of it is quite similar to that um thing that we just ran in in a single r session so you've got um a client sending a message to the server then the server creates a figure uh, and displays it in 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 r and then sends a message back to the client that i think gets printed out uh in the in the browser um so yeah um so we're seven c hd yeah um So, um, yeah, so this is the kind of code that's actually used in Shiny. So rather than using that WebSocket package in R, it's defining a WebSocket using, um, I think it's the WS library in, um, in JavaScript. Um, so you initialize a, a socket connection um and the the host and the port so for us it would be like localhost 127.0.0.1 and the port would be i think it's 8080 that was used in the example um and so you define a socket that that interacts with that host and that port and then um, define a couple of um, events, sorry, a couple of things that will happen when the socket opens and when the socket receives a message. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, right, okay, so there's quite a code here. Yeah, um, so the code the code for running this is actually in the the the, the books package. So if we have a look at that, ah, that's not. It's too much stuff to read there. How to create server. Too. Right, that's not gonna work, I don't think. No, no, anyway. Um so what were we what was the aim here? The aim was to show that the messages are received by the browser so if you look in this image here if you open the dev tools in the browser you can see the values that are returned and the values that are sent when the example runs it's a shame i thought the um the app would have run um uh, maybe it needs Oh, the address is already in use, but maybe it's just that I haven't shut down S. How do I turn that down? Uh, is there a close server? Stop. Okay, let's try that again. Right, so that's running now, the, the example code. And hopefully I should be able to navigate to this. There, right. 
Um, oh no, have I inspected the wrong thing here? Um, what's the thing that I need to change? Why that keeps happening? Is it the dimensions the display? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know quite what to do to change it though. Maybe if I just put this on the side, it might look a bit more. Right. Okay. Um. So network right uh what was the thing i had to check on network it was um what was the test it section now what was it to go to So yeah, it was quite clear. It was network and messages. Or maybe all would be okay anyway. So what's happened here? I've just changed the value. I can't see it here, but um you see in R, this was it started, it's received a message from the client that changes the number of bins to 40. Um, and changed the value to 29, which I think is the number of samples. And you see that the client there has changed what the histogram looks like. If we change it again. The histogram changes. So you've provided a client control over code that's running on the server there by setting up a web socket that runs between um, this uh, location and port on the uh, from the browser to a server that's running in an R session. Um, yeah, so so it's quite neat. I mean, sorry, I didn't take you through the the nuts and bolts of the code for that, but um, yeah, th so that kind of idea of um, setting up a connection between the the two ends of the the uh, of a web app and keeping that connection in place throughout the the life cycle of the app um is it is, is fundamental to have shiny works basically so when you're updating a value in the um the, you know in the user interface those values transfer across to um, the the shiny backend, cause all whatever reactive changes they need to uh, that 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 will happen in 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 the reactive side of a shiny app, and then any um, change any of those changes that need to be populated back up to the user interface, be it you know an updated table to be displayed or an updated figure to show or something like that um, will be passed using JSON along the web socket to the browser. Um, so yeah, it's quite neat. Um, I don't know whether anyone has any questions or anything like that or comments. Um, I'm just curious, Russ, if you only if you happen to know whether um, like Shiny for Python or Streamlit or something like that uses the same same mechanism. Um, I, I don't know if I'm they're more sure. modern I'm modern mechanisms or sure. if this is the, the cutting uh, edge. Uh, 
I, I, I don't really know. I, I, I imagine they probably wouldn't have. Um, they, they may well be using something more modern, but I don't know what is more modern. Uh, to, to, to be honest, so it, um, uh, I, I'd have to um, look through the code and f find out because uh, I, I, I really don't know off the top of my head. Uh, but I'd be surprised if they are using a, a different architecture for for the the web connection in in shiny for python at least um, I don't know. Uh -huh. I'm curious if you ever had to dive into the innards of this for a practical project, or uh, this is only useful for kind of pedagogical purposes to you know, like know how the engine runs. <laughs> to be honest, I mean, I was saying at the start of the video that this is the kind of stuff that I'm glad that is solved for me because, like, it's exactly <laughs> the kind of stuff that I try and avoid doing. Um, yes, I, I haven't really ever had to, to. I mean, I've written you know custom messages and things that, but. Um, precisely how they move from one side of the world to the other I I, 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 I don't know a great deal about but um, yes uh, shiny for Python does use web sockets um, uh, yeah according to um, this thing I'll put in the chat I don't know where it is on that page oh uh, yeah Thanks. Shiny uses web sockets for most browser server communication. Oh, maybe that's not Shiny for Python. Moment the browser tab connects. Yeah, I think that is about Python, the Python version. Yeah, it's the Python documentation. So, yeah, I think it does use web sockets uh, as well, which is quite neat. Um, oh, um, yeah, so there, there was a little bit towards the end of the, the chapter where they were talking about the session object that you have in the, you know, the server code for a Shiny app. And that is an R6 object similar to the WebSocket thing that we were talking about earlier on um, and has a couple of methods for um, sending messages from one side to the other and, and that anyway uh, i didn't want to go into that in much detail because i thought that the web socket stuff deserved a bit more um uh time anyway okay i um so that's chapter 11 um next week jack who i don't think's in the room is hopefully going to be presenting about um the uh chapter 12 which is about developing new input elements for shiny applications so in order to do that so you know you you can know the html you can know the css to define an input element but you need a way to you know when the users interacted with that element how does the data for that get from the browser to the back end and how does it propagate changes in the back end once received um and that's what we'll be learning about next week uh yeah i hope this week was interesting uh it was a bit rushed on my part i only really read the chapter a day ago um but anyway um yeah uh cool I, i'm quite enjoying this uh this book though there's some interesting stuff in it anyway I look forward to seeing you all next week. And if anyone wants to volunteer to present in two weeks' time or in four weeks' time, we, we do have a lot of spaces available. Okay.